Welcome to Agile Roots 2010, sponsored by Version 1, Rally Software, Vireo, Amirsis, Agile Alliance, and XMission Internet. Discount Usability Testing for Agile Teams by Ben Carey. Okay, so this is Discount Usability Testing for Agile Teams. Everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, um, I've been here. I work at Rally Software. I'm an Agile coach. Um, I've been doing, I've been on Agile teams, off and on different teams for probably been a little over eight years. So I've done just about everything that you can do on a team. Um, I'm certainly not a specialist in any area. I've done a lot of development, a lot of testing, a lot of architecture, a little bit of interaction design, but not a whole lot. Um, I've been a product owner. And did some sales work and it didn't work out so good. <laughs> I've done quite a few things. I've also worked at, I believe Rally is the 14th company that I've worked at. I've been there for two years. It's the longest job I've ever had. Uh, like three. Um, it's a great company. Um, I work in the services division at Rally. I don't build the tool, so I go out and I help customers get started. Uh, mostly working with new teams that are picking off, sometimes doing agile team ops. That's pretty much what I do, at least by day, by night. <coughs> I have a holding company called Hello Kinsho for all my experiments. They feel probably like I do. I'm not even sure why I have it. But um, I've done a couple of different things. Like, uh, if you've ever seen Big Visible Cruise, it's an information radiator on top of a continuous integration server. Um, that was an open source project. A bunch of other little side projects. I'll show you one of them as we go through. I'll show you a usability test that I did just a couple hours ago. Just grabbing somebody to say, hey, come check this out. And it's pretty bad, so I'll let you guys get into it. So let me start off with a, with a little bit of a story from a couple of, a couple of years ago. I was working at a big healthcare software company. This was before I went to Rally, so probably about, this was about three years ago. And I was working on this great team. It was, it was a pretty big team. It was probably, it started off as a waterfall project with about 300 people. Um, that failed pretty bad. So we switched over to an agile project, which had about maybe 100 people, which is pretty big to start with, right? But we had great developers. We had great testers. We had great user experience. We had some great partners over there working with us too. Um, it was a great app. So we were working on Something that looks similar to this for the electronic, electronic medical records application. And it was, uh, it was a very cool, very fun app. Again, great team. One of the groups that we brought in, brought in some people that did usability testing. And I had never done usability testing before. Right? I was, at this time, I was an architect. And pretty much what we did was they adapted to our agile cycle. They came in and they would pull people in a room. And they would ask them to do a handful of things. We would watch, we'd talk about what happened, and we would have that inform our backlog. Right? That's pretty much all we did. And it made a pretty big impact, I think, on the product that we were working on. Now, not long after that, this product was meant to go to market at a certain time, and it wasn't going to make it with the right amount of functionality that it needed. So to kind of hedge our bets, um, we bought another product from a different company that wasn't nearly as flashy and shiny. They kind of worked, although not totally. And it was meant for tablets, right? So it was meant for tablets and Z. And that was the core differentiator of this product. Right? You would see you know, in, in our minds, the physicians would walk around and they would use their tablets just like this. Right? Well, the company that had built this application had a lot of subject matter expertise in-house. But they didn't do any interaction with their users at all. Okay? Very rarely would they do anything other than go to trade shows. So obviously, it, well, it didn't turn out to be such a great use of the lab. And never, um, what, what I found was right away as we brought this app in, we had to go deploy it. So I went out to a, customer, a, a couple customer sites. And one place I went was in the middle of nowhere in Corbin, Kentucky. Has, has anybody ever been there? Any chance? No, I didn't think so. It's where uh, it's 
this really interesting small town where Kentucky Fried Chicken was started. Salt Lake. Was it really? Yeah. Yeah. Salt Lake was the first KFC franchise. <laughs> well, we got it. Yeah. 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 to the important. No, Ker Colonel Sanders started it in Kentucky. It was turned into Kentucky Fried Chicken when we got with Pete Harmon in Salt Lake and opened the first KFC. Okay. Education from working there when I was in high school. <laughs> <laughs> now you have the whole story. <laughs> it's, I was going to say, there's pictures of the, or there's uh, statues of the Colonel everywhere around the world. So maybe they were under long questions. Um, interestingly, it is a pretty, or it is definitely an interesting place. Um, whenever I went there, this was what I saw instead of using the tablet, like a tablet, people were using the tablet like this. Right? They were pulling out the pen and they were poking at the screen. So they were hitting the menus across the top and they were basically interacting with the application like that. Now this whole, this entire application was built around the concept of ink, right? And the ability to have handwriting recognition. And the ability to work well in that form factor whenever it was put there in the tablet. But whenever I went to Corbin, this is what I saw. And I thought, well, this is kind of a strange place. Maybe it's just these people that use the application like this. But as I started to go visit more and more customers, I noticed that everybody used the application like this. And if you talk to everybody on a team that went to go visit other customers, I don't think anybody ever saw it being used in tablet, which is kind of interesting, right? Because whenever you went back and you looked at the team that had originally written the software, whenever they tested it, it was all on tablet. Right? Right? So that's kind of the vast difference that I have in my background, seeing how, what the differences are in just being involved with the users, period. So whenever I think back on that, what could have made them a better, what could have made that application better, I think, well, talk to your users, right? Interact with your users a bit. It's pretty simple if you've done it a few times, right, to understand that that's important. So I started to think, was this the, the simplest thing that could possibly work? Because most companies that I visit, and I go see a different company every week, it seems like, at least three companies a month, done that for two years. Very rarely do I see people getting out and engaging with their customers. And if they do, it's somebody like their product owner or the managers. They, a lot of times the user experience people if there are any, but very rarely is it anybody else on the team. Who, who's a, a delivery team member? So developer, tester, scrum master? Okay, now keep your hand up if you've ever been to get visited. Great, that's more than I think I've seen since I've been out. So probably says something that you're here at this, at this conference. But did you notice, great, did you notice weird things whenever you saw your users? Right? It's always an eye-opening experience, right? So I think that if for most of these teams, these big companies, whenever I say take your developers or your testers or whoever and go send them out to go hang out with your users, they say, no, that's not gonna work. We don't have the budget for that. They just don't want to hear it. So I started thinking, what's the simplest thing that could possibly work to get people involved in this path? So everybody here that went out and visited customers, you all shook your head, yeah, you had pretty changing experiences, right? You saw interesting things. So I think that my assertion is that the lightest way that you can do this is you could do something like very simple, discount type, lightweight usability testing. So Donald Norman in the Design of Everyday Things has this quote, there's a big difference between the expertise required to be a designer and that required to be a user. In the work, designers often become experts in the device they are designing. Users are often experts at the task they are trying to perform on the device. I think this is very true. Right? Whenever I think back to that company, right, they designed it for the form factor, they designed it for the device, but even though they didn't even have any designers, it was like developers could be designed, but it was designed that way. You can very rarely do they look at the user. So my point, my point of view is this, and this was from my submission for this talk. Um, so whenever I sent this to Kay, I said, you know, this this was from the call speakers, the copper copper papers. I said, uh, this I really latched onto this statement. More importantly, Agile methods inspired me was to build great software products that capture our users' imagination and succeed in the market. 
create value for us <coughs> and our customers over a long life. My response to that was, I don't think this is true. Okay. That's what this conference is about. But I don't think that is the reality of most software. I think most software sucks, especially from the users. So if I look at like my Twitter stream, right, for the past two years, it's all about all the interactions that I've had with lots of different software. And it's all bad. Very rarely do I say, this is a great application. And think to yourself, when was the last time that you used an application and you said, that's a beautiful experience I just had with that app? And you walked away totally smiling. Does anybody do that on a regular basis? If you do, tell me, because I'd love to use the app. Because I don't use it. So I think that by doing this discount user testing, by usability testing, by getting in there and just seeing what users are thinking and interacting with users, we end up with much happier users. We will end up with much better software. Um, and we'll end up with a lot better experiences. So looking at why should we do this user testing, I'll show you what it is here shortly. And the first thing is because it helps, and it helps to get fit. I was just at a, at a uh, conference where a speaker was talking about usability testing in general. And he said, having usable software is kind of like having a set of food. And I think that's very true. Right? It's not that usability is your end point, right? but it's a great starting point. It's not a necessarily usability in and of itself. Doing this user test, usability testing, isn't necessarily what's going to get you great software, but it certainly starts you along that path. So think of this like um, like your journey, right? This is your base camp. And usability testing can start you there and push you off in different directions. And the reason that I think usability testing and the way that we're going to talk about it is so powerful is because there's a large degree of disproportionality in the amount of effort that we put into it and the effect that we get out of it. So are there any Are there any test driven? Are there any people that are infected with being test driven? Test driven development. Okay. We're trying to get infected. Well, TD, I see this like TDD, right? TDD is very, it's, it's a very interesting concept because once you use TDD, it's not just about the testing, it ends up being about all these other things. And I think that this user testing is very similar. And I think this is also true. So Tom Peters recently tweeted this. He said, unintended consequences far, far exceed the intended consequences. So I think that whenever you start, whenever you go down this path, whenever you start having a regular cadence of user testing, I think you get all these other benefits. And the biggest one of those is empathy. So having true empathy for your users, I think, is extremely important. It's the only way that we're ever going to get to great software. And this is one, has anybody ever used an empathy map? Do you have any idea what it is? Has anybody ever seen one of these? They're not very common. The idea is that on a flip chart like this over here, we would draw a picture of our user. This may be just a role in the application. And we would write things like what the user thinks, what the user sees, what they say, what they hear, maybe what they feel. The idea is that you're trying to have more of an empathetic standpoint with your users, right? You're trying to understand them a bit. And I started doing this with the teams that I'm coaching and working with. And what I noticed is that teams do this, and we get through the exercise just fine, and they say, yeah, this is who our user is. This is our system admin. Right? Or this is our um, whatever user or our doctor or our physician. But what I've noticed is that once they start to go out and they start to adopt usability testing, a very lightweight model, this changes completely. If they would go back and look at what they came up with here, these are all assumptions. Right? They're assumptions that you think are right, but they very rarely are until you can help users. So it's, it is a whole different world, right? From being on the team, you know, you're thinking from the developer standpoint, right? You're even a, and somebody like a doctor doesn't care about the manual, right? They're not buying the manual, they're buying the software and some children. Well, you know. <laughs> wow. I mean, this is true, I think, in those cases. It's, and I mean, it, it has everything to do with our education to how we learn to develop software in the first place. But we've been locked into certain mental models that tend to 
force us into cubes, right? You set in cubicles all day. Unfortunately, a lot of people, right? So you have these walls around you. But I think once you get out and you start interacting, you start realizing that the whole more is in the So I think that whenever you get out there and you start interacting, you move from this model, of, I, I think of it as I, then, him, or her. But you get, from this model, you start out in your cubicle walls, right? You're thinking about yourself. How would I use this software? How would I do this action? How would I perform this task? And then whenever you move into an agile environment, you start to move over into this them phase, right? Or stage. So you're looking at goals, you're all working together, you've gotten out of the cubicle, you're hopefully out of the team. And then you're looking at goals. So typical user story as a whatever role. And you start thinking about the goals. And unfortunately, I think this is this is certainly much, much better than this I phase. But once you get into that them phase, then you're just locked into stereotypes. And that's where those empathy maps are usually wrong whenever you start out. Whenever you start interacting with the users more deeply, you get into this point where you start thinking about real people. And you start referencing back to the tests that you've seen happen and to the people that you've seen using your phone. Has anybody seen the, the What is the Browser video? Google? Let me show you this. Watch users. 
you don't have to go through document after document right? or have people write you and tell you what's wrong with your software. Just watch them use it. Much higher bandwidth communication. Um, so Facebook, there's a there's a guy that um, that lives out by me. I live in North Carolina, by the way. Who uh, his name is um, Ryan Kidline. He's a user experience designer for Facebook, and he has this great great story about whenever he joined, he's just out of school. Um, his first task was to redesign the sign-in page okay, to get higher conversions, and Facebook has a lot of users, so if you improve the conversion rate by one percentage point, we're talking about a whole lot of users. So what they were seeing was they wanted to improve the conversion rate. What they noticed was as soon as people went through and went through the, I think it was three or four pages, and entered their information, whenever they got to this page, right, this page that shows your recommended friends, right, people that you might know, Everybody had these experiences that looked like this. Right? People were so excited, and they were, you know, some people started, he showed me the videos of the user testing, so the user testing. Um, there were people crying whenever they saw this. Right? Think about that, that emotional connection, 10 years, you know, somebody you haven't seen for 10 years. And so what he realized right away after watching those videos, and you would realize it too if you saw them, right? what you want to do is you want to get to this as fast as possible. So the anatomy of a user test, right? pretty simple. You just need a few tasks. There's tasks to be related to goals. You need a few users, you need a few observers. And after that, you need to debrief um, over a few years, usually works well. So you're not gonna produce anything like this. You're not gonna have these big documents. Usually what you're gonna end up with is a list of three recommendations. So if you come up really fast, they should inform the backlog. It may just be information at the very most. You may want to write a page after you do this. Right? These are pretty light. Now, as far as the things that you want to test, you may be testing stories, but more often than not, you're going to test some type of scenario or multiple stories. You want to test some path, some task that the user is going to be doing, which may or may not be a story. It may be one story, it may be more. So really you're talking about user case? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, it all, de it all depends on how you would how you look. it could be in this case, certainly. Okay? But if you're, it depends on the level of detail that your stories are defined at. So if you have a huge application, and you have stories that you know, kind of are on the edges of whether or not they're vertical slices, then you're probably going to have multiple stories that you're testing in some sort of test like we do here. Um, if you're a smaller shop and you're using a good programming language and you have some great people that turn out very really fast, then maybe what you So this is pretty much what, what I think it should look like to get started. Now I don't, I'm not gonna tell you for sure this is exactly what you should do, but I can tell, what I can tell you is I will give you this as a prescription to start with. Okay? I don't have a usability background. What I noticed was that doing this made a huge difference in how I related to customers and how I see teams related to customers. Okay? So we start off with the cadence. Right? That cadence may be your iteration boundaries. It may be sooner. Say you're doing two week iterations every two weeks. Why not pick three users? Okay. Maybe they're real users, maybe they're representative users. Have three observers and have a facilitator. Right. Facilitators, you have a UX group, <coughs> so like your, your UX group. As far as the observers, anybody should be observed. Right? Developers, testers, stakeholders, bring everybody in. Have everybody see what's going on. It'll change them as much as it will change you as you go through and watch this happen. So we've got our cadence. We're doing this all the time. The good part is that the feedback, this isn't like traditional usability testing where at the end you get a big document and a bunch of recommendations that you can apply to your next product. It's just like a, a retrospective versus like a project post mortem, right? You're doing this all the time. You're constantly refining what you're building. Hopefully that's informing the backlog and changing to, to help you build better software. So pretty much how you do this, you bring in a user, you ask them to do a few tasks, say maybe three. This may take 30 minutes, 45 minutes, um, probably no longer than that. The facilitator is gonna ask them to perform a task. Pretty simple. And they're gonna keep them talking, right? You want them talking out loud. You kind of want them narrating their thought process. 
This isn't perfect, but it's pretty good. And you're probably going to have observers observing. So we'll just pretend these are developers and stakeholders, testers, right? Everybody. So now you've got you know, five people in a room watching, and four people watching the other guy. How do you keep that guy from not feeling like he's in a fishbowl? Right. Um, well, there's there's a couple of things. There's software that will help, right? So you could, uh, you could just stream it mm -hmm. to somewhere else. It's one idea. Um, the other thing I would say is, if what you're doing is just trying to get started, don't worry about it too much. Yeah, it may affect your testing a little bit, but at the same time, right, you're, some information is better than no information. So as somebody who is often done the facilitating part, part of that job is a facilitator to set it up in such a way and be mindful of that so that this person is comfortable in whatever way they choose to set it up. So it could be just make, making sure they feel comfortable with respect to the conversation or that set up or whatever way makes sense sure that that person feels relaxed and can actually focus on it. Great, thank you. Now, do you bring them into your environment, or do you need to bring all your time to their environment because? Well, uh, it, it's really, there's, if you can, it's great to go to their environment, right? I would, I would, but it's also good enough in many cases, especially if you're getting started, right? So the, the point of view that I'm coming at with this is, let's just get started. Let's just get exposure. So I would say, yeah, if you can find a little conference room, book it, and bring somebody in, right? Even if you have to go down, you know, the hallway to find somebody, bring them in, even though they're not completely representative. Right? A little information, in most cases, is going to be better than no information. So you go through, you do your three testers. They do the three tasks. Um, the, the facilitator, the observers get together and discuss what are the three biggest things that we could work on, and that ends up with there in one piece of paper or changing the backlog or informing the backlog. And stuff. So that's pretty much all I'm putting forward here, is this little process. The magical part is they do it with users. That starts you on that path. And I don't think that you're just limited to software. You can certainly do this with paper prototypes. Um, you can do this with competitor sites. Maybe you do it with patterns that you want to implement. So say you want to do progressive disclosure on the website. Right? Why do you have to code it up? Find somewhere that's similar. Test that. Right? It'll give you information. The only difference whenever you do that is a lot of times you focus on what's good versus what's bad. Right? Because you want to see the good parts of other sites. So pretty straightforward. Um, this is what it might look like. Now what I did was earlier today, um, I just went and grabbed somebody from downstairs and said, hey, I've got this website. Um, could you do a couple of things on it for me? I'll give you an ad to just get the part of Pretty simple. He said, yeah, sure. I'll look at it. He said, you golf? He said, yeah. I said, great. Perfect. So I have, I have a, um, one of the websites that I have on the side. I, just a couple months ago, I decided it was too expensive for me to play golf because I play golf a lot and I drop down to work in North Carolina to do it. So I created a website where I can golf reviews so that I can call up the golf courses and say, hey, I'm writing reviews for golf courses, and I play for free. <laughs> <laughs> this actually works very well. Right? <laughs> so I've got $800 in golf in two months, which is great. Um, it's kind of fun to write the reviews. But the, the interesting thing is that I'm my really target user, right? But um, at some point, I would still like to see, you know, I don't want to create a portable app. Did this overnight, right? I was down at I was at South by Southwest, and one night I just got this idea because I had an upcoming golf game and uh, basically just put together a blog. So it was good enough to get started. I thought I could get it out there and get feedback. And this is the site. Oh, yeah. actually, um, whenever we go as we go through this, think about um, think about some of the the obvious. Think about some of the obvious things you see that could use improvement. And we'll talk about them for a short period of time. But they'll be pretty obvious, I think. Yep. You guys hear that? It's the, the Myrtle site. Go ahead. Don't you just go ahead and you can correct. Just tell me what you see. So looking at the navigation to see what the website does. So it's got 
listing of courses, some, some way I can subscribe, probably create an account, I'm not sure. Um, so what I've done at this point is I just told him to look around to where he saw. I tried to uh, go to uh, the website for the golf course to see how much it, how much it cost, and it's like I had four four air. Exploded ball, ball, yeah. Now, I didn't consent for him to find us, right? I just never clicked that link. <laughs> so you didn't see anywhere to get, to get the price? No. You know, interestingly, like you mentioned that they were going through this. He wants to find the price to figure out if he's going to play. And this was really interesting to me because I've tested this on a few people. Nobody has ever said anything about the price. Um, okay. This is why I started the site. Right? And I never thought about it. And any of the reviews that you see, it never says the price. Because I never really know it.
much what it looks like, right? Somebody's going to be doing the facilitation and just asking the questions. Can you perform this task? Or can, which is, should lead back to a user goal or a user need. And basically, you watch them do it. You keep them talking as observers. It would be something similar to what you guys were doing here, where you're going to observe, you're going to listen. We also like to record them. Yeah, we've been just stressing a lot in the last few months, and you still go back to that. Get yourself, maybe not going back to the videos very often. But now they do using testing of mobile devices. It's quite hard to get three of us for us around one person with a small, yeah. small device. Do you have any software that's similar to Silverback for an iPhone or Android devices? I think going back to those, I'll go back a lot more often because I can see them a little better. Um, so the question was around like an iPhone and how do you get a video. The, the only thing, please, if anybody has seen this done, please speak up. The only thing that I've seen um, as far as actually testing an application is using like a, one of those Gorilla Pod type things to just mount a camera on. Oh, you okay. hold it down and it just videos down. Um, the well, certainly one hard part with that is, is a lot of times the form, of, the form of the phone is how they hold, hold the yeah. device actually impacts their, their It's color. very similar to my story at the beginning, okay. right? Yeah. You don't get out and you yeah. don't see how people are using it. It's not that you're going to find everything from doing the typical user testing, right? If you lay, if you're laying the phone down and you're poking at it, you get a little video camera right here and people standing around you, right? You're probably not going to find everything. You may find some obvious things. Yeah. Um, has anybody used an app that was good for that? Anybody? Well, I know there's video camera mounts for mobile devices. You just, it basically clips on the top. Clips on the top, and it's a little. Yeah. 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 Over and oh, and hold on to it. I mean, you have to look at it. But I wonder if there's just a recorder that you record the yeah. screen. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that is good. Good. Because when I do my testing, I don't even record the face. You just record the audio and the screen. Yeah. Um, is there a reason that you don't include the face? Uh, we just haven't found it necessarily that useful because when you say, like you just had to ask him what are you looking at? Yeah. And since you're not doing eye tracking, you can't tell anyway. Um, so if I, so that's why. And, I, and I'm using, so we just decided to skip the extra expense and use WebEx. Um, so I use WebEx for to do the remote testing and it's just cheap and easy and fast. Also, whenever we, man, whenever we get to the end here, I'll talk, uh, I'll see if anybody has any recommendations on any tools they can use or things you like. Okay, so the first thing I want you to do is to think about the current website that you're working on or the last project you were on and think of five to 10 things that you might want to test. Right? This is, so I'm not gonna have you go through goals and task analysis of what this is, but just think at a high level. If you were going to test five or 10 things, what would they be? So what are things like the major functionality of the site? Maybe things that you've lost sleep over? Maybe things that you have other input that you think are usability problems? Think about those things and write down five to 10 things. I'm going to give you two or three minutes to 10 things.
increasing feedback as fast as possible and doing it without a huge cost. The advantage is that okay, you can do it very easy. It's pretty simple. Just like this is. Okay, so I need, what I need is the tables to have like uh, say five or six people. All right. So if you, whenever you open these up, there's a couple. They're laid out in a couple of different ways. The usability test script at the front. I want you to pick a couple of different people. So you've got instructions on your table too. That's what I passed around earlier. So what you're going to need is you're going to need a facilitator. You're going to need somebody that you're going to be doing the testing on. And then you're going to need the on. What's that? Test subject. And then you're going to have. At least three observers, right? Everybody else is <laughs> So this, this one right here is the usability script. Okay. Everybody else should get one of these off the top. Oh, cool. Whoever it is that chooses to be kind of the person, the test subject, right, for lack of a better term, um, you get the gift card. <laughs> okay, so let me explain this to you in the next case. This first sheet, this first sheet that you have, it talks about, it says, uh, at the top it starts with usability and test script. This is from a book called Rocket Surgery Made Easy that was just released not too long ago, probably like two, three months ago. It's a great book. You can read it in like half a plane ride. And it, that this is straight out of that book. Now, what you're going to do whenever you start out, the facilitator is going to talk to the person that's doing the testing, to the person that's being tested, and they're going to basically just read through this script. I would read it pretty much verbatim. And it even says in here that you're reading through the script. Okay? There's some things in here that won't apply, like it says this will probably take an hour, and I'm going to start the screen recording software, which you're not going to do. Right? Just keep that in mind. Just read through this. As you read through it, you'll get to a point near the end of it where it asks you to go through and do the task. So to start off with, before you do the task, it will have you ask some questions like, uh, how much time do you spend on, online? Okay. How much time of that? What percentage of that would you say is using email versus browsing the web? What are your favorite sites? Just a few things to get the people talking. Right? And this is just a facilitation technique. Have people talk, and they'll talk more. Right? So you need to have them go through it first. And after that, whenever it says to go through and actually do the scenarios, you've got two sheets. One is um, a blog entry on a WordPress blog. So the task is that you're going to write a new blog entry. And the scenario talks about your context. Right? This is why you want to write it. And you're going to basically go through and do a blog post. I set up a WordPress blog last night. And the username and password are on here. Okay. So you can log into it. Everybody, <laughs> let me know if anybody doesn't have a laptop to have internet access. So did you guys want to you want to come sit over here? Yeah, you can watch me fumble. Sure. Yeah. You also have a second. Oh, he wants to log in. You've got two tests to do. Okay. As you go through and do these, the other people need to observe. Right? Just write as an observer, write down what it is that you're observing. Think of your biggest things, your top three things, and then we'll do great. Okay? Are there any questions about this? Observations did you have while doing that? 
So did you guys to that? What worked for you? What didn't? <laughs> You know, um, I, I have an observation. I was one of the, I was the person doing the testing that was taking me. I tend to be somebody uh, who will speak out. I will. I like to think out loud, and you can tell by how I use my hands and just kind of yeah, think out loud. And, it, and that was probably helpful for the group because I did. And I don't know if you run into personalities that don't like to think out loud, but you bias your application toward those who do. Yeah, I, I'm like that. I don't like to think out loud. Right? I'm kind of a bad person to do the test. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, from a from the facilitator standpoint, what they should be doing is just prodding, right? And it may be that occasionally you test people that just aren't good at doing it. You're not testing the people, right? You're testing the software. But if you go through and you do that test, and it just may not be a good personality for it. That seems to be fairly rare, honestly. Um, most people can adapt to it well. So we have still Sometimes they use our, our software as well. So I know how to use our software pretty well. Right? I, I also do, in addition to advocating, I train on, on our software as well. Um, so I know how to use it pretty well. Whenever I watch people use it, I always make a conscious effort to not say, oh, you should do it this way. And I always wait, usually five or 10 minutes. I don't want to do it too long. But I want to observe what's going on. Right. So if I see somebody taking a path to get to here that goes like this, and I observe it happen, and I make notes about it, and then I talk to them later about it. It's very hard, especially if you're somebody that's involved on the team, to not say, oh, go over here, click that. You don't want to do it that way, right? Or to help guide. If you don't want to guide, what you want to do is observe how people are using the application without you setting these up. Is it okay for the facilitator to ask things that uh, the testers not saying, like um, how are you feeling about this, or uh, do you feel the interface is too cluttered, or things like that, or it's just like 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 like, like asking things to to. I would try a lot of times that will you have to be careful of what you ask because you'll guide the answer, right? So like if I said like on on the Myrtle Golf Review site, if you look at the top um, across the top the taxonomy of the app, there's a says like a home course listings about us and subscribe. If I would say something like, uh, where do you think you would subscribe? Oh, no, right? Maybe an, an open question like, if it's, uh, I think how, how are you feeling right now? Or? Yeah, I think, those are, I think those are great questions like uh, that, okay. right? So how are you feeling? What are you thinking? What are you looking at? Uh, what's troubling you? Right? Very open-ended questions. And you want them to narrate their way. Because what I did is, um, what, uh, what, how are you feeling? He said, uh, well, maybe the, the, the rest, I would like this to be bigger, uh, and the rest is cluttered. So then I asked him, uh, is the clutter like keep bothering you? So then I narrow it, because he said that. Yeah. I said, OK. Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think so. Um, because it was, you were building up the words that were used. Uh, okay. So I don't think that's guy. So, OK. Um, Something in that scenario, something good to say would be, you know, tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um, and I, I fight with this all the time, is trying not to bias the response to the human the person I'm talking to, which is something that you would do, and uh, or lead the witness. You know? <coughs> so it's, it's something that I constantly fall into. I'm always catching myself on it, so it's something to be aware of. Not yeah, not yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, something too, right? Yes. Um, um, the list of instructions that was there, um, and I guess we were, we were running sort of maybe on the other side, it seemed a little confusing, uh, almost like it was much said, a uh, person facilitating, we want you to do this, 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 right now. And that's, almost, that's the feeling I got from it, whether it was there or not. And I'm gonna, uh, I remember the last thing on the list. Whenever you do, maybe that, I mean, it, that may not be the case, right? It may be that the, because those scenarios feel a little wrong, right? And they have a good bit of detail in them. 
So in that case, if that's what if that's what you're hearing, right, then I would shorten it. So it probably depends on your subject matter expertise and what it is that you're Would it be better to walk through sort of more step by step um, um, for uh, I'm trying to think of an example of the WordPress thing, like maybe it's like where would you go to to, to go to a new post and then wait wait for that as a facilitator and then be like, okay, well let's Let's click there, go to the page. Let's give it a title. Okay, so like the granularity of the task. Yeah, yeah you could you could certainly break it down a little more, especially like with with the WordPress one, right? If you haven't used WordPress before, that's pretty it's pretty confusing to do all that because the interface is pretty right, it's pretty confusing. So yeah, you could certainly break it down more. I would just try it, right? Try it and see what happens, and then adjust it and see how from one test to the other, if you get changes. Or if you notice frustration, or the other thing is, at, as a facilitator, whenever you go through and after you read the scenario, you want to give the sheet to the person. Okay, you always have a physical sheet so they can go back and reference to it. Because, like you said, you're going to remember the last thing, even if it's only a couple sentences. Right? It's definitely. It might be off topic, but uh, what what would happen if you receive you got a website and you receive an email with uh, someone saying, "I always get stuck here. I would like it to be like this." Do you take that as a sort? I mean, with the same importance as someone who you observe made a usability test, or is that a, of lower importance? Uh, because you weren't. I don't know that I could answer it really without more context. I, I mean, it depends on so many things, right? Uh, the things that you observe are going to be higher than. Probably what I would do is if I saw that, I saw that that was fairly frequent, then I would go and figure out what to do with that. I would go and put that as a scenario for somebody to test. You know, a good example of that is, for instance, the application I talked about earlier from the tablet, right? A large number of the support calls came in and they talked about floppy laptops. We had no idea what that was, right? What was happening was because of the leverage of being pushed on the top of the screen, the hinges were giving out. So whenever that happens, well, what do you do? Uh, I don't. I don't know if it's ever got implemented or not. But um, whenever we sat down and we did some paper prototypes, just kind of with people within the company of what could this look like, right? You can come up with great solutions or good enough solutions pretty fast. And in most cases, those are good. Like for instance, the you know, whenever we the user experience group got around it, you know what they came out with a couple hours later is well, can we move the menu to the bottom of the screen so there's less leverage to give us some more time to figure out how to fix the hinge problem? Because that's a partner problem. Okay. I mean, you can come up with incredibly brilliant solutions if you just get to collaborate. Okay, so let me let me run through the where next piece. We've got about 10 minutes left. So iterating, um, iterating on the feedback. I think that my personal opinion is that in the Agile community, we've lost the passion around iteration. As far as iter not iterations, but iterating on products and making products better and using feedback to help inform what we do with the product. As larger and larger companies adopt Agile, I see this all the time, they still start off with a big requirements document. They just put it in one item, what's we call it a backlog, and they expect it all to come out at the end. They're not iterating on top of what it is that they're doing. So I think we need to think about this a little bit. This process can help drive that, can help the iteration. But if you're not going to change anything, then what gets the feedback, right? The value is the feedback that comes out of this process. Um, this is an interesting part as well, as far as thinking about how to fix things. So even though a piece of duct tape covering a hole in your pants might not be pretty, it's still better than a hole. This is from that rocket surgery made easy book. It's hard for me to latch onto this idea of how do we do the from the development world, whenever I was a developer, right, it took me a long time to figure out to do the simplest thing that could possibly work and to be comfortable with that. From a design standpoint, it's hard for me to take that in too, right? Because I want to make things that are, you know, I, I want to make the next news chair of software right? or websites. I want something to be beautiful, but at the same time, you have to balance that. So just doing something to help improve the problem. And iterating your way and having emergence come out of that and emerging into a great experience is very valid as well. As valid as, as we think it is. So do, do the minimum that you can to fix the problem. And if you think about this in terms of tweaks, okay, tweaks instead of redesigns, this is another 
Um, definitely Vada spoke if you're interested in this. The templates came straight out of there. A lot of these quotes came straight out of there. It's a very easy to read and very actionable. Um, but this is this is what Steve says about this, right? Tweaks cost less, they require less work, they don't ruin lives or break up families, which is a very good point, right? You're, you're not gonna um, hopefully be working 80 hours a week trying to implement a tweak. Small changes are more likely to happen. They're probably not going to break as much stuff. People don't really like big redesigns anyway. They aren't as risky. And the most important one is that they don't require lots of money. So is it Jerry you're saying you put in a lot of tweaks so at the end you can have a new product? But it, it wasn't a in your face all at once thing. Yeah, maybe it may have not. I, I, um, you can certainly iterate your way to a new product, but depending on the adoption of your product. For instance, like eBay at first, I remember hearing a story about how they had started out as like a yellow background, right? One day they switched it to white, and they had a huge uproar. And because everybody didn't know the site was still the real site, right? it's over a period of a year they changed the hex values to put it to white. So I don't know if that's a true story or not, but it is really. So that's what I think you can you can iterate your way there. That's an extreme example. Right? eBay has a lot of users. Facebook has a lot of users. But for our applications, most of the time, just slow intentional changes, not slow intentional changes, but not big bang intentional changes, I think experience can work. Another thing I want you to think about is as you listen to the people, that the observers, and you talk about it and you debrief, think about thoughtful induction. Your first instinct, and I saw this whenever I was a developer as well, to fix a problem is to add. And so you go and we add more. To fix an interface or a usability problem or an experience problem, you'll go and add more things onto the app. Many times, way more often than we actually do, you can probably subtract. Right? So whenever you have a problem, think about if there's things that you can take away to help fix that problem. Right? So John Mayer wrote a book called The Laws of Simplicity that's excellent. He has a law in there called Thoughtful Reduction. It's a very powerful thing to think about. You think about subtraction and the power of subtraction. You don't leverage that a lot. You build interfaces and you build applications on top and on top and on top and on top of each other. Remember, a lot of times, if we really know what it is, that the value that we're delivering, we can take things out. All right, so buy-in. A lot of times, you don't need buy-in. Just buy a pizza, buy some beer, ask people to do tasks. Okay, you've got a list of tasks right there in front of you. If you do need real buy-in and you need money, frame it as an experiment. Whenever you go talk to people and you try to get money to do this, or you need some type of approval to do this, frame it as an experiment. I would say to do this with everything that you want to do as well. Right? Start thinking in terms of experiments. We're going to try it. We're going to see if it works. If it doesn't, we won't do it anymore. We just learn something. If it does, then we'll go forward with it. Everything is an experiment. Think of this as an experiment as well. The second thing is um, to promote it as minimal cost, because it is. Right? I bought you know, Hundred dollars in gift cards or something today, but we could have got a lot. We probably did grab, probably collected it, a lot of information that would have been very useful to WordPress <laughs> or to National. You know, I send them emails usually twice a week. But minimal cost, and you also have dis disproportional returns. So Nielsen Norman Group, whenever if you look at, uh, I'll find the link to this and write it up here as well. But if you look at the number of users that you need to test to find high percentages of usability problems. This is a, it's an interesting curve that you can certainly exploit. And so if you look in this range, the three to five range, you're getting a lot of stuff. And you can build a lot better software by getting finding this number of usability. Yeah, he's got a very thick research paper. Um, I'll give it to you for you. Yeah, it's on um, it's on this site. But yeah, they did. I often wonder how many users maybe I should bring in to test. Right. Yeah, bring he, five and six. I know I can do And he, had, he tells the assumptions behind the model. Right? The important thing as far as getting started, I think, is that it's zero users, you get zero information. So keep that in mind, too. So my, my point of view on this is we need to really stop building stuff that sucks. We should build better software. We can do that through empathy. And the specific action step that you can take for this is you have a list of five to ten things. You can take that back to the people that you work with, or maybe some of you work together, and just find a few people to test. 
pretty easy thing. I found somebody this morning in between sessions. Find a few people to observe. That's one we do anyways. So you probably find those people. And then debrief on his observations. See what you find out. See what you learn. And figure out where you have to know. So these three steps, plus the five to ten things that you have done today, find the top ones, and you've got enough to get started with this method. The benefit to this, hopefully, is that it brings us to a place where we realize that we need to understand our users more and we have more empathy towards our users, right? And that should lead us. Just this technique as a tool in and of itself isn't going to get you to great software. It's going to get you into a mental model where you're thinking about your users and the understanding of your users and moving you towards the right direction. <coughs> Things like adopting contextual inquiry is very, very powerful. Where you go watch and observe users place where they work in their natural environment. And I don't want to discount that at all. I think that's wonderful. I think you should do it. Many times I think that the companies that aren't doing anything, this method will get you started very soon. You get, as soon as you start to bring in stakeholders, and your stakeholders watch the users do something like you just did with adding a new post to WordPress, I think they're going to be blown away and think, wow, that's hard. So the last thing I'm, I, I want to talk to you about um, hold up your hand if you're on Facebook and or Twitter. So there's a few people that aren't. Right? Certainly like 80% of the room, 85, 90. This is really interesting. I, I, I was at the South by Southwest conference and I stumbled into this uh, into this room where somebody was doing a presentation on um, what happens to your social life when you die, right? Like your social media life, which was really strange topic, and I just happened to walk into this room, and I listened to this thing, and I thought, this is really strange. So whenever I walked out, probably about two weeks later, I got this become a fan email from Facebook. This is whenever Facebook had become a fan versus like, and it was from somebody that had sent it from their brother. Their brother I went to school with and had recently died, and so this was very strange. I got a friend, uh, a friend request for a fan request somebody who just died. So I went to the page and I looked at it and started digging through the page and there's all these like emotional wall posts about, you know, I remember this and whenever we did this I had so much fun and people talking to the person that they were still around. And it was in its own way it was kind of disturbing and kind of beautiful but at the same time. And then whenever I started thinking about that, the other piece over here was I started this is my daughter Haley. And I'm, I'm a recent dad, my first daughter. Um, I started thinking about what happened, like her life is a lot different than my life growing up, right? And what happens whenever her kids are around? I mean, if you live your life on those social networks, there's probably tons of information that all these people can find about you at one point or another. Right? So my granddaughter or grandson can probably figure out everything that I ever did, right? Because it's somewhere between Facebook and Twitter, in most cases. So the thing that I don't want to have happen is I don't want to have my last wall post to be. Ben Carey is building shitty software. <laughs> so I think that we have a, I think that because we create this stuff, we have a gift that you can give to people, right? You have a gift to create it. And we're actually creating stuff. And we can create better experiences in part of what we do, right? So we can give these things out to the world. We can make happy users. We can make happy people. Um, and I think we can build better software because I really do believe that most of these are And that's it. Thank you.